enjoy. Uh, all right, good morning, everybody. It's time to start um, the Montrose Forum for this Wednesday. Again, we have two incredible speakers that you will leave informed, which is what we always strive to, at least not knowing things that you didn't know when you came in here. Promise that's going to happen today. So we have John Gibson from Secret Creek, which used to be Colorado Yurt, and we have Wayne Hawk from San Juan Construction, which both of them have very, very fascinating stories in there. Yeah, they're at, it's going to be worth your time to be here. Um, as we always do, at the end of the forum, they'll, each speaker will talk for about 20 minutes. Then we'll finish up and we'll, we'll take your questions at that time and or positive comments. We really won't take a negative comments. We kind of frown on those. And I also want to, which never really gets mentioned, a big thank you to Will Woody, who's in the back, who is always here filming for us. He puts it out on the City of Montrose YouTube channel. So you can watch this again. We do have a lot of people who do turn in that, that tell me. I see them through the week. They said, yeah, I watched it on YouTube. That was pretty incredible. Sorry I missed it. Couldn't be there, but I'm glad that I had that opportunity to see it. So I will introduce John Gibson. He is he bought Colorado Earths in 2019. And everything I said, he goes, I'm getting into that. I'm getting into that. So I'm not getting into that. They, he and his wife, Kelly, moved to here in 2020. And since then, he's hit the ground running. And it's incredible to watch what's happening down with his new plant and, and the yurts. I asked you guys to drive by and see him. Hopefully, you did. So without talking anymore, I'll turn this over to John. You see how this works sound-wise. Um, so good morning, everybody, and, and thanks for giving us an opportunity to come in and give you a little bit of an update on our business and, and our project that we're building over at Colorado Outdoors. Um, I thought I'd step back a little bit and, and talk, uh, first of all, uh, about kind of how we got here. And for those who've been <coughs> in town for a while, obviously know that uh, uh, Colorado Your Company has been here for quite a long time. Uh, my wife, Kelly Gibson, is here as well, so welcome to Kelly. And, um, um, you know, in my prior life, I talk a lot about, I actually spent uh, about 32 years in the lawn and tree care industry, is where my background's from. Prior to that, uh, um, you know, when I was in college, I was studying electrical engineering on a football scholarship at Mines, and decided I didn't want to be an engineer, because um, I want to be outside more. So, spent time in the landscape industry, uh, lived on the front range, uh, worked for a business that I ended up running and uh, we had about 400 employees in, in three states. And when that business got sold to a private equity group, uh, I decided it was time to go buy my own business and, and do my own thing. Uh, Kelly and I spent uh, a whole bunch of time looking at, believe it or not, uh, uh, 200 businesses to buy and looked at everything from, I studied cattle ranching for two and a half months, realized it's romantic, not realistic. <laughs> um, we studied everything. I didn't know you could buy a rural FedEx routes and studied those. We almost bought a winery. We looked at uh, excavating businesses, solar businesses. We looked at a lot of things. And uh, ultimately, we, we decided that uh, we narrowed in on a part of the world we wanted to live in, which was Western Colorado. Having grown up on the Front Range, I always wanted to get off the Front Range and had an opportunity to look at Dan and Emma's business and, and realized that they had a lot of things that were really attractive to us. Uh, one being the legacy brand, um, the great reputation, outdoor product lines, we wanted to be involved in, in still in the outdoors. Uh, potential for growth and diversification. You know, they had uh, their product lines, but lots of things that we could do with those products. Um, you know, a uh, challenge of improving a stalled business, the business had hit the plateau that many businesses hit after many years. Um, it was a 43-year-old business when we bought it. Um, and, uh, you know, Montrose business climate was pretty important to me as I studied communities to move to. Um, you know, here in the city of Montrose is, has a great reputation for helping businesses out and, and having a great climate to make you want to be here. And so we appreciate the work with the city that we've done so far. Uh, and obviously the Western Colorado lifestyle. You guys get it. You live here and, and we all enjoy it. A little bit about kind of the journey. Uh, Dan and Emma started the business in 1976. Um, it was Earthworks teepees at the time. Uh, the, the quick story, uh, they were living in a teepee at 10,000 feet uh, outside of Breckenridge, and somebody asked them to build another. And that's how the business was going. Right. And so um, they started off as Earthworks teepees, um, moved up to Ridgeway for a while uh, where they lived, and 
1994 moved over to Montrose. Company name got changed uh, from Earthworks TPs to Advanced Canvas Designs. They used to do awnings and other things at the time, tents, and, and uh, started doing more canvas work, and then I started doing some yurts. Um, moved in, the, changed the brand to Colorado Yurt Company, and then changed the logos again uh, with um, Colorado Yurt, uh, Earthworks TP as the TP brand, and Cimarron Tents being the tent brand. Um, one of the things that, that we acknowledged when we were looking to buy the business was the Colorado Yurt Company name was actually limiting for our other products. So people didn't know that we did tents and teepees anymore because they were so focused on the fact that we did just yurts themselves. And so we actually decided it was uh, better to put an umbrella name, hence the name Secret Creek, over the top of our three products. And uh, that's um, really the kind of the background of why that change was made. A little bit about, does not like that so bad. Um, there we go. A little bit when we purchased the business, um, one of the first things that we did was, uh, you know, kind of reestablish what our values are going to be as a, as a business. And uh, our values spell pitch. We pitch your steepies and tents for a living. And uh, we talked about having good, friendly people. Um, we want to just enjoy the people that we're around. Uh, um, integrity above all else. Uh, what I call timberline standards. I say we start where other people look up to. And for those who live here in Colorado, you get that. Um, it's a little bit aspirational right now with the supply chain challenges and trucking challenges, but we're working hard at it. Uh, creative solutions, trying to do everything we can to uh, be creative in what we do. And then really having hungry people. Um, I like people that are hungry for something, whether it's your troops, the Boy Scouts, uh, whether it's, it's another group that you're involved in, whether it's our products and things like that. I love people that are hungry for something because I think it gives you a purpose in life. And it doesn't have to be a hungry for what we do, but you just have to be hungry. Um, that makes for a better environment. Um, you know, a couple of examples of creative solutions you may be aware of. You know, we bought the business in January of 2020. March is when uh, COVID hit. Uh, we thought we were bankrupt. Thought it was over. Like that was that quick. We moved to town, it's done. Um, we ended up uh, finding out that we could make uh, face shields uh, uh, out of some of the products that we had, and we found a way to survive COVID for a month or two while we were ramping back up to get back into our production. Uh, uh, some of our first clients were Montrose PD, uh, Tegaret Express, and some of, the, uh, uh, some of the bus things we did. You know, we did a, a, a couple of things to try and help out. You may have seen a bunch of the teepees around town um, when we, uh, it's interesting that it's not working. The, um, um, the city had approached us about, hey, could we help the restaurants uh, during COVID? And uh, so we donated a whole bunch of teepees with the concept to teepee the town and uh, try and let people have outside spaces that they could uh, use as restaurant spaces. And uh, the city was actually awarded a, a governor's award for that activity. So pretty cool to be involved in that. <clears throat> you know, we have a lot of different things that we're involved in, just a short list of things. We're really well known, interestingly, because of Dan and Emma's history of uh, the teepees. So there's teepees everywhere. Uh, we, we donate them to the U Museum, Museum of the Mountain West, um, Bootstown, Hope West. Uh, we've done the Outer Range Project for the school district. And so lots of really cool stuff to be involved in in, in the community. Um, Garrett Walker, our director of sales, uh, heavily involved in Rotary, which also helped lead us to hosting the uh, Rotary Leadership, um, Youth Leadership Academy <coughs> conference. And that happened here in June, where we hosted 60 kids that actually stayed the night in our yurts, TVs, and tents at the new village. So it was. It was Crazy, <laughs> but it worked out pretty well. So, um, you know, a little bit about in the middle there. You know, I mentioned how we got to Secret Creek. We, you know, the uh, brand launch has is, is been in progress here for a couple of months now. We do have uh, our new branding, which in, includes uh, the, obviously the new logo. There's a little bit of history behind the logo. Um, uh, why do I want to be in Western Colorado? Um, I, I'm an outdoors guy. Uh, I spend a ton of my spare time in the backcountry. Uh, packing around with my mules, uh, so riding mules and, and pack mules, and I do a lot of backcountry hunting wilderness stuff. And uh, we thought that we could bring in Margie, which is one of my mules, as our logo. And so she's actually, um, you know, uh, around the facility. Like we literally had a meeting with her in our base. Um, she's hanging out in the pond at times, and uh, we're actually even taking her to a trade show this fall. So, so um, we, we, right now we have. 
six mules. I'm only supposed to have four, but we got six. Um, and uh, we do a lot, of, a lot of stuff with the mules, uh, even when guests come and hang out with us. Um, Kelly and I happen to live up on uh, Boston Park. Um, that's where we live up by the Black Canyon. And um, you know, um, both our kids are, my kids are grown. Uh, one lives in Tennessee, the other lives in Michigan. And so uh, we're just kind of on our own with our mules right now. It's a pretty good lifestyle. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the new brand, obviously, the Colorado Yurt brand is a product, Earthworks Teepees. And then we changed the name of the tent brand from uh, Cimarron Tents uh, uh, based on a conflict with another company and decided we would go with Destination Tents because we feel like our tents are a destination. And you'll see that if you come take a look at them. Um, um, a, a little bit about Secret Creek itself and, and really, it came from, uh, people used to always ask me where I spend my time. And if you know anything about guys that go hunting and fishing, I'm not telling you. So um, I would always tell people Secret Creek, that's where I'm at. And then what we realized as we started to kind of rebrand the company is, is that we could talk to people about their Secret Creek. And really that's what we feel like we provide is through our, our structures, the yurts, teepees, and tents, we give you an opportunity to connect to your Secret Creek, whether that's in a desert setting, whether it's in a mountain setting, whether it's in your backyard. We have people that use them for restaurants, for yoga studios. Um, the, the uses of them are pretty amazing, but that's our goal is to try and help people find their secret group. Um, this is definitely not going to stick. Um, the little bit of an example here real quick of what the, uh, the, the new website looks like. Just launched it, um, soft launch, so you can go check it out. Um, after we got that, while we're in the middle of all that process, of course, the, all the branding and everything to grow the business, um, this is a, a quick view of what the inside of our old shop looked like over on South 4th Street. Um, it might be a little tight. Um, if you look in there, there was actually 35 people working in there. Um, and we have used about every ounce of space that we could within that building. And we had multiple building sites around it that we were using for other parts of our business. That's just the sewing area. Um, so we needed to get a new facility, and and really what uh, we came up with was you know working with the folks over at Colorado Outdoors, with the City of Montrose, uh, Timberline Bank was our bank partner, um, and really you know trying to be part of this this Made in Montrose campaign, and, and we want to be proud that we're here and that we make a difference in the community. Um, we're over on if you've been over the site yet, over behind Ross Reels is where we're at up against the river there on Mayfly Drive. Um, came up with uh, some design concepts that really were about uh, trying to showcase the river frontage. Uh, so we purposed, when you go to our building, it's gonna be a little bit weird the first time you go over there. The, the entrance is on the river side, so you drive up in the back of the building. Um, but we don't wanna have, there's no reason to have that beautiful frontage not be showcased. So the entrance to the building faces to the west. Um, some of the things that, uh, a little bit of details about it, it's about a three plus acre site. Uh, we built a 30,000 square foot manufacturing space. I left this slide in because it was one of the ones I used early on um, as we were starting the project. We were going to use 20,000 square feet for us and 10,000 square feet leased and then use it for expansion. Um, the length of the project to get it up and running, we did never take a tenant. We just took the whole thing. So um, we've been growing fast enough that we needed all the space. Um, the intent of having a display village along the river trail and uh, we put together a partnership with the city on a, a public-private uh, use restroom facility. So we donated a piece of land on the corner of our property to allow the city to put in a bathroom on the trail because there was no trail on the north end of town. And so um, you, you'll notice that if you are uh, walking the trail, it's a beautiful building. Striker company finished it up and uh, looks amazing there on the, on the corner of our property. Um, and then also, uh, you know, we had a focus on local and regional contractors. So uh, our GC was not from town, um, but uh, I think about 90% of the other work outside the steel building itself uh, was all done by local contractors. Um, so we you know, had a focus in choosing contractors that were here locally or in some regionally up to Grand Junction. Um, a couple of renderings of what the building looked like in, in concept um, as we put it together. Wow, that is not going to work. The um, little bit about our groundbreaking. So we actually broke ground. Uh, we started in, in July of last year. 
Um, I always tell people I'm not a gold shovel kind of guy, so we decided that a BYOS party would work better for our groundbreaking, so we had everybody bring their own shovel. And uh, we had a random group of lots of really cool stuff. The uh, whole community came out with all of our employees and, and uh, had an awesome uh, groundbreaking to get things kicked off. A um, little bit of what the site used to look like when we started. And then a little bit of what it looks like uh, while we're in construction here. Um, you can see uh, the flex buildings, or the buildings that are mostly complete on the right side of that picture. You can see the, uh, the trail around the outside of our property is the, is the river trail, and then uh, the building structure that's there. You'll also see that kind of the, the top center there right along the trail is really a retainage pond, and that's what we turned into the, what we call the Secret Creek Village. So um, a little bit of concept there. Um, this work. So, uh, as you can imagine, uh, it was not the optimum time for us to be building a building. Um, supply chain was brutal to us. Uh, the cost of materials was uh, significant. Um, between the time we got all of our bank approvals and everything and finally went back for the final price on the steel for the building last spring, the steel price went up $600,000. <laughs> Um, and so we've been managing our way through that um, and, uh, you know, keep plugging along with the project. And uh, I've learned a term I hate, uh, value engineering. Um, it's not a fun thing to go through. Uh, finding ways to save money on everything that you've decided, decided you're going to build. Um, but it did, uh, it was ugly and brutal and, you know, we, couldn't, we didn't get roof insulation for 90 days. Like, so we had to sit for 90 days waiting for roof insulation. Um, all kinds of delays on products. Uh, garage doors, we just put in our garage doors finally last two weeks ago. Um, they were nine months behind. Um, so it's just amazing how those things impact your project. You just couldn't forecast those kind of things. Uh, but we're pretty excited to um, have uh, got through the project to this point. Um, this is what it's starting to look like uh, in construction on the interior of it. So this was us building all the sewing tables that are in there. Uh, a little bit of uh, the picture on the right is actually going to be open floor space where you'll actually be able to watch our artists for ATTPs. Um, these pictures are actually taken from um, what I call the second floor observation deck. So uh, we actually built the building so that you can walk in, enter the building, uh, meet with one of our, our sales guides at the front, and then walk upstairs and tour the facility from the observation deck without actually having to go down on the floor. So, we intended on a main destination site that people would come visit us and want to see how things work. So um, it looks a lot different today. This was in the middle of our construction. Uh, as a reminder, that's what we were in, and that's what we are in. Um, the, uh, the next part of the project, of course, and maybe the fun part mostly for the, the community is the Secret Creek Village. So in, intentionally um, building all of our structures for people to come visit. Um, a quick little idea of what the uh, layout looks like and um, you know the you can see where the building footprint is and then you can see where the structures are planned uh, throughout the facility some of these in progress pictures of us actually building all of the, the uh, yurts and the teepees and the tents <coughs> this is a view of where the teepees are along the river bend of the trail you can kind of see in the back uh, behind the sign there, uh, that little dark building, that's actually the restroom as it uh, was being completed there in the corner along the trail itself. An example of what the, the yurts look like now. And I should say in progress they'll have decks on now. This is what it looks like in the evening. Um, that was at the Rilo event when we were hanging out with the kids. There's something else unique in the background there that would pick up something that's not a your TP or a <laughs> So for anybody who's walked by recently, that's uh, that's a covered wagon. Um, and so uh, we're partnering with a company named uh, Planescraft out of Kansas, and uh, that's actually a glamping wagon. Uh, believe it or not, if you come by and look at it, it's set up as a full bedroom, and it's actually meant for. It's got a full bathroom on it. it it's meant for people to, to use on a glamping resort, like a cabin or something like that. So. It looks really cool um, along the trail there. And then this is a more uh, recent photo, so that's the front of the building. 
you know, purposely, uh, um, as you asked me today, are you gonna paint the steel? No, not, we just want it to rust. Uh, we're kind of a rustic brand, and so it's not meant to be fancy. Um, and then a little bit of what it looks like, uh, that's actually Margie in the, in the village. So she's hanging out, uh, walking around. There'll be days we're actually gonna put a, a bit of a, a fence in, a wire fence in for the mules to be in the pasture. So you have to see if you come by it on the days that the mules are there, uh, hanging out in the village. One thing we've been struggling with, and uh, we've heard a lot of, of folks already asking us who are walking the trail, is, um, hey, can I come in? Y yes, um, but there's a fence around it for a reason. Um, it's actually private property. And, um, and so we, um, we expect people to come in through the building side, and we've fenced the entire trail side. It's meant to be a walk-by park, um, and we're amazed how many people are just climbing the fence. Um, and just walking around and, and uh, we think it's because we didn't have signage of helping people out. So we're just trying to remind people hey, it's private property, it's not for everybody hanging out in. Uh, we get the, the question frequently, hey, what are you gonna do about the homeless? And uh, they're walking, when folks are walking by, they're like, wow, what are you gonna do about the homeless? And like, hey, we have a great relationship with them to this point and uh, we're counting on the community to help us with that, um, you know, to help us, you know, uh, make sure that we have safe structures and that um, ultimately, today it's a display village for people to walk through and, and to see our products and see how they're done. Uh, in the next 12 months or so, we'll actually be furnishing many of them, and it'll be a try before you buy overnight stay. Um, so you can actually rent one and come stay at the village and, and experience what it's like to stay overnight in a teepee, a tent, or a yurt, or a wagon. Um, and uh, hence the reason that the bathrooms are there as well. They're all dry cabin uh, style, so you'd have a chance to actually go to the uh, uh, restroom, uh, right there on site and be able to stay overnight with us. So um, the private par property part is going to be interesting for us to kind of work through as we uh, encourage more and more folks to come join us. Um, but it is uh, pretty amazing. How many people have actually been there yet? Have anybody walked by or seen it? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, uh, do you like it? Oh, yeah. Does it, does it look okay? So um, our team has worked so hard and I can't uh, thank them enough for trying to figure out how to actually get our product out the door, get a move done, build the village, uh, and deal with all the supply chain issues and all the staffing issues and COVID and all the other crazy stuff that goes on. So we just wouldn't be here without them, uh, with all the great people that we have. And, and not only is the, we have a good business climate, there's some really great people that are in town to, to work for us and work with us. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, one thing I'll throw out is, is an opportunity for everybody is uh, we're going to have our open house on uh, Friday, August 19th from 2 to 6. Um, and if you notice, I'm not calling it grand opening because we're not going to be done. Um, but we'll call it an open house, kind of see where we're at and, and come through and, and get a tour of the facility. You'll get to do the upstairs tour on it. Um, you'll also uh, get a chance to walk through the village. We are accepting guests in the village right now as far as uh, being able to do tours and things. So you're welcome to come by anytime. Uh, just please stop by the front desk and, and uh, we'll have somebody walk around with you and, and go through the, uh, the, all the problems. So, with that, I could open it up for any questions. to foundations and electrical permits, plumbing and all that? So the, the reality of, of us selling our product in lots of different uh, settings is it really depends on the local zoning codes and who allows what. Do they look at it as a temporary structure? And if it's a temporary structure, um, it has a different level of, uh, of expectations from engineering and things than it does if it's a semi-permanent or a permanent structure. Um, all of our yurts are engineered and to the site specifications, so um, wind and snow load, and then uh, we also have, we sell SIPs decks uh, underneath them for insulated decks, and then uh, typically the customer has to deal with uh, the ground connection themselves to get that through. Uh, permitting as far as 
uh, inspections for electrical and plumbing, those are all individuals for the customer. So today we supply the structure. Uh, we don't do any of the rest of the finished stuff. That's for another contractor. Okay, this so um, Matt, hang, hang on to that question. You won't forget it, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, let's, let's go on to our next speaker real fast. But before we do that, let's give John a big round of applause. Um, yeah, so, John, how many employees do you have now? We're before they built it. Right now we're actually around 60 or so. So when we bought the business, we had 37 employees. Um, we're around 60 right now. We peaked at about 68 last summer because we had a whole bunch more work uh, pitch-wise later in the summer than we do right now. So but we're sitting right around 60. It's a great presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, so our next speaker is Wayne Hawk, and he's with San Juan Construction. Those of you who have lived in Montrose for a long time know the building as United Bank or Norwest Bank, and it always was a bank in the middle of downtown. And I have known about San Juan Construction because I have a very close friend that works there, and she, she would tell me bits and pieces of this fascinating, what they do is just absolutely fascinating. Then one day she comes, she goes, well, I'm leaving. I have to fly to Hawaii to put in a bid. I'll be back in two days. I'm like, what? You're going to do what? So they're very broad. They're, their story is very interesting. So I called Wayne, and I said, Wayne, please come talk to us. We'd love to hear it. So I, I um, we're, and actually, Wayne brought his slideshow down from all the way from Grand Junction. So they're just now getting that hooked up. So in the meantime, I'll have Wayne come up and um, do you need the slideshow to start talking? Okay, all right. Well, so you guys, let's introduce, I'm gonna introduce, give him a round of applause for Wayne Hopkins. Thank you, Wayne. So Wayne's gonna do his own bio while they hit, hook this up and get it going. Um, very interesting and yeah. I will bore you with my talk. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my two brothers and I, in the mid 80s, 1980s, decided we should start a business together. And so in 1986, we uh, decided to move to the Montrose area. Uh, one of the brothers is a master plumber, the other a journeyman plumber. I have degrees in forestry and landscape architecture, so we decided to do uh, landscaping work as well as mechanical <coughs> type work. Since then, my older brother Frank has semi-retired in Hawaii. He still works with uh, National Parks and Veterans Administration. But, uh, my younger brother Carl and I still work with Sam Bob. Our first uh, location in Montrose is where Velocity Car Wash now is. We were very fortunate to <coughs> Bill Nichols was the owner of Montrose Realty. Uh, he was pretty much retired at that time, but he allowed us to share a 16 by 20 foot building with him. Uh, but the best part was the rent, including utilities, was $50 a month. So we were very so we stayed there for at least a year, year and a half, and then bought 11 and a quarter acres south of town where uh, Velocity Car Wash and uh, U-Cell Auto is now located. So then we had space and room to, to expand a bit. We did projects around Montrose, Gunnison. Uh, the other reason we located Montrose because of the nice area, which was what you mentioned, was Telluride. And we recognized that Telluride could be a uh, had future and a lot of growth in that area. So that's one reason we located it here. And so we did there. We worked private homes for landscaping at the airport landscaping, uh, mechanical and landscaping at Spring Creek Chalet and the uh, San Juan Bed, Ridgeway Reservoir, the mechanical, uh, the plant in Norwood. But uh, the oil shield, of course, collapsed in 1983. So things were, were tight around this whole western slope. And we uh, thought there had to be other opportunities. So 
We checked out Davis Bacon rates. I don't know if you're familiar with those. It's a federal mandated uh, wages for all trades, electrical, mechanical, even labor. And they were about uh, three times what the rates were, what the pay was around Montrose at that time. And we looked at uh, where the highest rates were. They were in California and in um, Hawaii. And we thought, well, Hawaii sounds interesting. Let's, let's try that. So we put together a four foot by four foot by eight foot box with tools and uh, with a little equipment. We had sent it to uh, Kauai and uh, did a project for the Navy at Barking Sands. It was a small job. It was about 220 some thousand. But myself, younger brother, and one other uh, person went to do the work. Uh, and we were pleased. It was 56 housing units. We took out the existing water tanks and put in new larger ones and then two four foot by eight foot uh, solar panels for hot water heat. Uh, and then we did another project for the, uh, for the Navy there on that project or on that site. We were putting an eight inch water line out to one of their launch pads. Uh, we did other work on Kauai, but within the next three years, moved to Oahu for our main office. And from there, we worked on uh, Molokai, Maui, Big Island, and more work back on uh, uh, Kauai. So, maybe this is quite good to get, but... Uh, I'm getting there, there. it's taken a minute. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just finding different laborers is a question we've had through the years. And we, of course, found a lot of people from around this area, uh, California, Florida, Michigan, wherever people wanted to, to go to a, a different site and work for a time. It wasn't too difficult. It was an advantage in Hawaii uh, in the middle of the winter. And you'd ask someone if they wanted to a project and make three times what they could here. We usually had good success with uh, finding people and all the different trades. <coughs> Some of the work in Hawaii, we hopefully have a chance to show up on that slide. But we did everything from fuel tanks to antennas, uh, skiffs for secure rooms, harbor work, treatment plants, fuel tanks, runways, telescopes, all of this was federal work. We were sticking with the federal work. It was um, a lot of paperwork and research. We'll get into some details on that. But uh, you need to get paid and they had the rule book the FARS, Federal Acquisition Regulations. So that's why we stuck with the federal. And we've worked with, uh, and she can go through some of these details, but then we worked for the Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, the Coast Guard, uh, the National Parks, and of course the Army. The bonds, which is another thing to recently speak to, but all the jobs that we did required bonds, which is just an insurance, basically, for the federal government. We have a bid bond, so if you uh, did the work, if you bid the job, you would have to do the job. Otherwise, you'd lose the bid bond. Performance and payment bonds, where if you didn't perform the work, then your bonding company would come in and do the work, and of course you'd be out of business. And that only happens once. And then the payment bonds you need to pay for, for uh, materials and labor and all the other things that you'd have to do. Uh, It's going to be worth waiting for, so hang on, hang with us. <laughs> Let's go ahead and describe some of the other stuff that we'll see in a few minutes, hopefully. Uh, telescopes. We worked on telescopes on Mauna Kea on the Big Island, and uh, it's just under 14,000 feet. So, in that uh, setting, the altitude was an advantage to us. None of the local contractors could work at that elevation or that altitude settings. So we had no competition. We had competition in Michigan and other places, but not from Hawaii. Uh, 
uh, and so we did quite a bit of work on modern data on Gemini scope, as well as uh, the NASA infrared scope. The NASA scope was interesting because the intent was to keep it cold because of the infrared, of course, and so uh, we put some high R value insulation inside the scope, as well as uh, chilled water and uh, reflective coatings on the outside of the, of the telescope because the purpose was to stay within two, degree, two degrees of what the actual temperature was. And of course, at night when they're using the telescopes, it was cold. And, uh, we had snow and ice up on Mauna Also worked on Haleakala on Maui, another scope. <coughs> I mean, how about um, while they're getting that up, let's, I'll ask you some questions, okay? And you can answer them. So when I called and asked you about um, doing this and you said it was you, your brother, Frank and Carl, and you, one of you was a plumber, right? A journeyman. Two of them. Two of them, yeah, and you were a landscape. So to get from that to where you are now, I found to be quite interesting. And you went from, out where Velocity Car Wash is, out south of town to the UCL lot, then in town and now at what I was referring to, the old bank. So I asked you once, I said, do you get a lot of people that call and ask you how long it would take for you to build a house here in town? We do get that question, but we don't do any work globally now. We've worked at, uh, through the years we did, uh, for the first three or four years, but once we went to the wide islands yeah. and moved out from there. Yeah. And so, um, how did it, and you probably said this while I was trying not to get in their way, how did it start that you actually got with the Department of Defense? I mean, did you go after that or did they come and ask you to do that, to work for them? We, as I said, we were looking at uh, Davis Bacon rates, how high they were in Hawaii, and so we did a job on Kauai. Like as a fluke, or like, guess what happened? We actually got this job on Kauai. Well, no, we looked, we did something called dry getting. We, we got the plans and specs and took it off, but didn't turn into the we weren't On Kauai? Yeah. Time, well, at least you picked some nice places to make bids. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I mean, we didn't go to Iceland or, you know, some place like that. So, um, how many projects do you have going right now? On the Kwajalein, there's four projects uh, replacing the pier. We're uh, replacing all their fuel tanks. Uh, there's a vehicle maintenance shop, and then the runway. We're a subcontractor on the runway. Okay. There. And then uh, in Diego Garcia, there's probably six different projects. I saw some pictures of the equipment. That's one thing that is the logistics is everything for our business. We have to bring in all the food and uh, everything except, excuse me, the food and the fuel is the only things that we can count on uh, at these outer islands. So we have to bring in our equipment, all the materials, uh, housing, our own housing. So it's... And so do you hire a lot of local um, residents at these places or, in or the how Marshall does that... Islands, we try to hire some of the Marshallese, uh -huh. otherwise uh, on Diego Garcia, everyone there is no native population there, so we bring everyone in. Do you visit each one of these places? Yes, I do. Do you have to? Do you really? Yeah, not, not for a while. Not, not, not during COVID. So, uh, no, it's been really good. So he was very, um, I thought your story about what COVID did to you guys as a construction company and the logistics of, he said when they would send employees out to these places, they didn't come home for years. Some of the Filipinos have been on Diego Garcia for three years now, and we were able to get them back. And so that's, that's unfortunately very difficult. But um, but they made good money. Yes. Yeah. So yes. while you're there, you're 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 making bank, and then that's the they purpose. travel the world. Yeah, right. that's a perk. So um, what 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 does your future look like? Same. It's very busy right now with China. All the operations in the Pacific are uh, kind of a big deal right now, so Kwajalein is one of the top areas for uh, our work. There's a lot of work, more work than what we've been doing, uh, but it's definitely busy. And yeah. same way in Diego, Diego is where 
we were there in 2001, uh, just before the 9-11, and so that base, about quadruple of the population with military, and then the planes that fly out of there to the Middle East, the B-1 bomber, the, the B-2, the Batwing, and the B-52s, uh, we built shelters for them. Okay. So while while we're doing this, let's open it up for questions just for Wayne, because I think you guys have some. I know I have some. I could sit here and belt you all day with questions, and what's not acceptable is why we can't get the PowerPoint up. But that's okay. We don't. I don't know anything about that. So does anybody have a question for Wayne? And we'll start there. How large a staff do you have to manage all this? Those figures you have to speak, you said I might have that question. In Montrose, we have a little over 20 people. This is our main headquarters. In Manila, we have just under 20 engineers, and they help us out there. Uh, in Diego Garcia, just over 90. And in Kwajalein, we have over 230 people, including about 20 expats, 50 TCNs, and over 150 Marshallese. What else is it all managed from uh, here in Montrose? Yes, everything's coordinated. Uh, it helps us because of the different time zones. We can work on a bid, for instance, during our eight or ten hours, and then uh, one of the other sites can take over and do their portion. So we can literally work 24 hours. So you wanted to know what a TCN? Yes, please. Oh, yeah. uh, third country nationals. So that would be the Filipinos. We've got a staff of Filipinos. Some work in this office, but most in uh, Diego Garcia and some in Bajal. Wayne, a few years ago, I was fortunate enough to be able to tour your building here on Main Street. And after I got through security and got to tour the whole building, I remember up on the wall is a huge lighted map of the world with lights as to everywhere that you have been involved in construction. Could you please tell us some of those other areas you've been to other than Hawaii? Uh, sure. Adak, Alaska, if you're familiar with the Aleutian chain that runs off the southwest coast. We did work for the Navy there, which is pretty remote. Uh, we had people work down in Chile because um, they worked on Mauna Kea. It was a similar scope and so they wanted uh, us to come down as consultants. Coast um, Rai, out in the Marshall Islands, get electrical plants for those folks. And uh, like I say, all the Hawaiian Islands. Hopefully, we'll I don't know if take a picture of the map, but we can see the other ones. Johnston Island, which was our first jump out of the Hawaiian Islands. It was uh, it's about 880 miles west, southwest of Hawaii. It's where uh, they incinerate, uh, it's completed now, but when we were there, they were incinerating the uh, chemical weapons, mustard gas and things like that. So the wind always pretty much blows the same direction, but they did they give you a large pin and slap that into your thigh. If the horn went off and the lights flashed and go into a concrete building that was secure, that, of course, that never happened, but it caught your attention. <laughs> the security for your facility, I assume that's because of your Department of Defense contracts? Yes, right. We're required to ask more details on that. They've, they've uh, stiffened that up. It's more complicated than it was at one time because they're, uh, the cyber attacks and everything else, they take it pretty seriously for drawings and how we're supposed to leave the office or leave the desk. Uh, do your employees ever have to deal with visas? Visas? With visas? Do you yes. Deal with visas? Oh, yes. And we help to do that and get the green cards and, and some of them become citizens. But uh, yeah, depending on where you're going. Mm -hmm. Are they all U.S. employees? No. No. No, some are from other countries. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay, who else has a question? Jim, now don't make a hard question that it's hard to answer, okay? I assume that there's not a lot of companies around the world 
It has relationships with the federal government, the United States federal government, and being able to go, you know, outreach to doing construction jobs. Do you, um, what percentage of your jobs that you get are uh, based on a preferred contractor basis or a bid process? Uh, most are bid, but we've done really well in some of the sites, like on Diego Garcia, it's pretty isolated. So uh, if you're there and you have the, the batch plant, and the trucks and cranes and everything, it's just expedient for the uh, government to say, hey, well, this is the best benefit for the government to award this to the contractor. Most of them are bid, though. It's limited, though. They have, uh, we're on May talks or May or max multiple award construction contracts or or award task orders so they uh, limit the number of contractors that can bid on the jobs and it's very complicated now Reese's does a great job with that but it's complicated to even get in on a contract because they're uh, they're pretty particular you have to show that you've worked in similar areas with similar size and scope of work so are we ready for a, a, a no, no slideshow? No slideshow? No, slideshow. no Wayne, you did great without no slideshow. <laughs> Actually, when he walked in, he goes, I, I gotta have my slideshow, but you don't need a slideshow. You're great. You're, you're perfect. I think what you have to really take away is that what I took away from your whole story was that you started as landscaping, plumbing, all the way to the Department of Defense contracts. That's That's a big step and that's impressive and that's coming right out of Montrose, Colorado. Like you said, this is their home base and everything that happens, like you've even built bomb shelters, correct, for some of your? Yes, I was hoping we could show those uh, that are like 86 feet long, 26 feet wide, and 8 feet, or 11 yeah. feet high uh, out on Diego where they put the, uh, some of the bombs. And, and you said at one place they, they gave you a pen that if the, the um, Sirens went off, you injected, that, is that right? Is that what you said? Or? Yes, in, uh, in Johnson Island. And what's in that pen that you're injecting yourself with? <laughs> I think that would be one of the really big questions I would ask. When I was there. Yeah. They assured us that that was the better alternative. <laughs> All righty then, so I'm gonna bring John up as well, and if you have questions for Wayne or for John, um, let me get the microphone to you because it, it's hard to hear the questions. It's easy to hear the answers, but not the questions. I was just going to say, Wayne, you may not realize this, but a lot of people from Montrose go up to the top of Mauna Kea on their bicycles. And I was there with my husband and my son, and that's so cool to know that you were there. It's something that probably should be told to people around the community that like to go up there. Very it's actually cool. more impressive that you would go up there on a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> not me, my husband. I'm not crazy. But it was funny because they wouldn't allow my son to go up there because they said his lungs will burst. And I was like, well, it's about the same altitude. But a couple from Europe offered to drive us up the last part in the car, and the Rangers would let us. Yeah, so but we got up to the top parked. So it was very impressive. So we should tell people that so when they go there, they see it because it's very cool. Thank you. They told us that the, uh, they only had 60% of the oxygen that you would at sea level. We, that was difficult for our crews because we live in Hilo, or, you know, or Buncton, and drive up every day about an hour and 20 minutes each way. Well, that's, so. that I drove from Hilo too in a car. My husband drove on his bike. Yeah. So I thought it was never going to end. It looks like <coughs> outer space to me when we were there. Okay, does so anybody else have a question? Oh, Matt, you definitely have a question. And I you saved my it. question. Yeah, I'm yes, coming. you did. <laughs> Wait, I'm impressed. Patient. You did as instructed, didn't you, Matt? Uh, yeah. He does work for the school Following system. Instruction. <laughs> yeah. So I have a thank you and a question for John. Uh, just on behalf of the school district, you guys have been, you and Secret Creek have been great partners with our outdoor learning. Um, and, and the last several years, you know, we've had a great relationship, so thank you. My question was about your transition and rebranding. Can you talk a little bit more about what all goes into that? I know there's risk to that, or assume there's risk to that for any business. And is that something you guys sub out to a marketing company? Do you do that internally? If you could kind of talk about uh, the decision making behind the branding shift. I think uh, it's scary. 
Okay, start with that. It's scary. When you take a brand that has uh, a, a 43, and at the time 44, 45 years worth of history, and work on what the transition is, the, 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 the amount of places that you have to change the name is amazingly, you, you have no idea. I think my voicemail's updated yet on my cell phone. I realized like, we, we, there's so many touch points that, to where the brand's at. Um, the, the key component that we realize we live on is our internet search. And so if we can't get found on the internet, that's a big problem. We spent 40 years getting the second highest ranking in our industry for our brand, which means if you look in the background, we didn't change coloradoyurt.com. Uh, if you search secretcreek.com, it'll actually forward to coloradoyurt.com because you have to keep that, that search ranking in the background there. Um, but we looked at all the different materials that we might do, whether it's handouts or whether it's advertising that we do, um, even all of uh, you know, um, where we are located and changing the addresses of things. Um, we worked through a lot of the pre-planning on our staff with our uh, internal marketing team and director of sales and our staff, and we use an outside resource for a lot of that website stuff. So they, they, we developed a brand new website with a company called Revolutions. Uh, out of Denver that I had worked with for many years before uh, that helped us navigate all the way through building the website and, and uh, right now our, our search traffic has not declined. It's actually going up with the transition so we're like a little bit, uh, okay, it's okay for now. Um, um, but uh, definitely a little bit more work to be done on finding all the pieces to things that still need to be updated. Yeah, we didn't lose the Colorado right Yurt. Yeah, we didn't lose the Colorado right Yurt name. It's it's still our product, so it's still there. It's still in all the search fields and everything that we have. So. My question involves San Juan. Were you originally Montrose residents, and that's why you're still here? It seems like logistically, Hawaii might be better for all of you. Um, and the second part of that is. Do you, are you happy with the direction you're going or when you made the decision to do this, do you wish you had made a dif different decision because it seems like logistics are huge? Uh, first answer is my brothers and I grew up in Delta, so we're from the Western Slope and we love the area. As I say, Montrose was even a little cooler weather-wise and otherwise, and uh, near Telluride is why we located here and with the um, Zoom and, and all the internet and so forth. It, it really doesn't matter. We're in contact as we were last night with people in Manila as well as uh, Diego Garcia on some kids. So, and I'm sorry, what was the second question? Do you wish initially that you had headed in a different direction or are you happy you're going this way? Oh no, it's it's been exciting. We've made mistakes. Um, probably made some decisions that uh, had we known then what we know now we wouldn't have done but it turned out all right and it was never boring i can promise you <laughs> so you don't miss the landscaping and plumbing at all well we still have that on some of the projects oh, okay. most of the projects it's still an element so it's still all right we have time for one more question then i'm going to ask you both just to give us a quick um conclusion of really why montrose i mean John, you both alluded to it, but just I think you could be thinking in one sentence or less, just give us this, why, why we choose to live in Montrose. I could answer it, but it would take all day. <laughs> but yeah, if you guys could just tell us why Montrose, when this last question is done. Hi there, John, question. Uh, Yurt versus Gur is the first, and number two is, you're not giving away the secret locations of all those pretty photos, right? <laughs> no, we're not giving away all the uh, secret photos. The, the one thing I did, uh, one of the very first slides I had was a picture of a tree. And uh, that tree is actually at Secret Creek. Um, and it's uh, what to Kelly and I call the decision tree. I was having, while we were buying the business, I had to hike up to that tree every day to talk to the Chinese <laughs> to get cell coverage. And I realized when I got done, I've been standing by this tree for five days and making phone calls. This is the decision tree, so it's actually in my office. I've got lots of photos of it, so um, yeah, but no, I won't tell you where it is. Um, the other uh, question about Gur versus Yurt. Uh, so the Mongolian Gur is where the Yurt came from. 
And so actually the, the Mongolian tribes would travel with their gurus and take them down and they're meant to be a, a mobile structure. The Western US and, and the Western part of the world now makes them a semi-permanent structure. You can still take them down and move them. We can put one down and take it back up uh, in, in about 48 hours um, from the platform all the way to the structure. So it goes up pretty dang quick. Um, and I will say, I, would, I love the idea of all the dots. Like we actually sold yurts back to Mongolia. And so we have we have yurts in Mongolia. Um, there are modern yurts. So maybe you two should talk and when you might need some of his. I find it interesting you found a way to get two landscape background guys on the scene. Yeah, that was, was, that was the cabinet. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's awesome. So John, um, why, why Montrose really quickly? Or just, just yeah. kind of said, but just give us some think, reinforcement. At the end of the day, it comes down to people. And that's it. I mean, it, 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 if you have the right people in the community, um, you get to make a difference. And um, uh, for us, it's, it's the feel of being in town. Um, and there's a lot to that. Uh, you know, Kelly and I are fortunate to have, have made a big impact in the community we lived in before. And I mentioned in another presentation I did, our goal in moving to Montrose was to help in the community, but not tell you what to do. Like, uh, I think that, you know, if, if everybody remembered that we all came from somewhere, uh, but we all have to get along where we are and, and let the community be what the community wants to be, uh, those great people make a difference. Yeah. Wayne? I certainly agree with the, with the idea of the people. Uh, we also like the recreation. You know, you can, if you want a concert or something, you can go to Denver, four and a half hours. Grand Junction's not far, but uh, it's just a small, peaceful town with a lot of great people, and uh, it's a good place to live. Yeah, and you, do, you two are definitely two of the great people in Montrose. They're two, the, the whole, my thought when I picked this, these two for this topic is two businesses, two of the many businesses that make an impact in Montrose, and they do it um, way quietly, doing it all over the world, both of you, John, you came in and I, I knew Dan and Emma really well, and so I was glad to see that you bought this company from them and you kept it going. So I would like everybody to give a round of applause, and let me just also say, before you actually, um, Wayne's IT person, Risa, came down from Junction, right? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes. And um, she and Barbara tried really hard. Thank you both. <laughs> I'm sure it's a great slideshow, just these four. You know, we'll keep them up and you can look at these. Um, you, if you can stick around a little bit if anybody has any questions, just for a couple minutes. Um, I am Phoebe Benziger, along with Kathy Hevers, Barbara Bynum, and Judy Ann Files. Thank you for coming. Now, who's got next week? I don't know. Kathy does. So let's just tell you what we're going to see. And now you can give them a round of applause. Too.